Welcome everyone. It's a sunny day in Melbourne for once. So we'll just give it a minute or so for more people to enter the meeting and then we'll get started. Hi to everyone joining us. Welcome to our 45th seminar of the Centre of Research Excellence in Aphasia Recovery and Rehabilitation. I'm Dr. John Pierce, a research fellow at the CRE and co-facilitator of the seminar series with Sonia Brownsett. Before we do anything else, I'd like to acknowledge that this event and many of the participants joining us today are located on the lands of traditional custodians in Australia. And today I am speaking to you from Woonwurrung land. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future, and we extend that respect to any First Nations people joining us online today. Delighted today to have Dr. Kirstine Shrubsall joining us, who is from Princess Alexandra Hospital and UQ. But before I formally introduce Kirstine, I'm going to briefly cover some housekeeping. The best way of connecting with what's happening at Aphasia CRE is through our blog. Uh, we also have Twitter and Facebook accounts, or X as it's now called. Um, and on that blog in particular, you can read all the latest findings, calls for participants, and uh, find resources for um, people with aphasia. Uh, you can subscribe to that blog to receive updates through email. Um, and today, as always, you are welcome to tweet along with today's similar seminar um, using the hashtag aphasiacre. Please note this seminar is being recorded for future viewing and our YouTube channel contains past seminar recordings and today's seminar will appear there in a few days. During this presentation, there might be questions for Kirstine, so if so, please ask them by writing them in the Q&A uh, button at the top of your at the bottom of your screen rather than the chat box and you can enter those questions at any time throughout the presentation and uh, like or upvote those questions that are most interesting to you from others and at the end of her presentation Kirstine will answer as many questions as we have time for just remember to keep uh, your questions brief for my sake and uh, keep them questions rather than comments with that out of the way, I'm really delighted to introduce Kirstine today. Dr. Kirstine Shrubsoll completed her PhD in 2018. Her research focuses on improving implementation of evidence into practice in speech pathology and multidisciplinary services, with a special interest in stroke and aphasia rehabilitation. Her research involves collaborating with clinicians to increase capacity to deliver best clinical care and reduce evidence practice gaps. Kirstine has published over 30 peer-reviewed journal articles and has been awarded over $6 million in competitive research funding. In her current role as the Conjoint Research Fellow in Speech Pathology at the Princess Alexandra Hospital and the University of Queensland, Kirstine provides research capacity building and mentoring to speech pathologists and supports to multidisciplinary research. Prior to this role, Kirstine worked clinically as a speech pathologist in hospitals in Queensland and New South Wales and completed a postdoctoral research fellowship at Clark from 2021 to 2023 and worked as a senior lecturer in speech pathology at Southern Cross University. And Kirstine is the co-founder and deputy lead of the Collaboration of Aphasia Trialists Implementation Science in Aphasia Working Group and a research affiliate of the Aphasia CRE. I'll hand over to you, Kirstine. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. So I've just got to get my sharing right, which we practiced many times. So <laughs> hopefully no guarantees on Zoom. I've got it and I can see everything. Yep, looks great. Okay, that looks good. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I too would like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the lands um, and just Go ahead. So to this next slide, I'm coming to you from Kwandamuka country in um, southeast Queensland. And I'd also like to thank all of the speech pathologists who have participated in my research over the past few years. Um, I couldn't have done it without you. And thanks to my co-authors and collaborators on my projects, 
and to the CRE for inviting me. I'd also really like to um, pay a particular thanks to Associate Professor Emma Power and Professor Emirata Linda Worrell and Professor Dave Copeland for their support and mentorship. So as John said in his introduction, I'm all about implementation of evidence into practice. And sometimes I write lofty ideas like this into my grants and into my CV where I say what I'd really like to see happen and what I'd like to be achieving with my research. So I really want to be able to develop an innovative model of implementation that can improve service provision for people with aphasia and their families through supporting speech pathology teams and services. So as you can see at the centre of all of my research is this idea of implementation of evidence into practice. And you might have seen my name pop up in a few different areas, but at the centre, it's really all about implementation for me. So I've done some work with the Stroke Foundation and the Australian Aphasia Rehabilitation Pathway, which is around developing those recommendations that can guide clinicians with their practice. And then I'm also really interested in supporting that implementation of the recommendations that have um, high levels of evidence. So looking at areas such as collaborative goal setting, aphasia friendly information and communication partner training. Another area of interest that I have is really looking at um, how we can develop and implement new areas of practice and new um, service delivery models for aphasia. So I've been involved with studying the implementation of intensive and comprehensive aphasia programs or ICAPs. And Dr. Jay Dignam presented on the CHAT program, which is one of these ICAPs in a recent CRE seminar. So yeah, so as you can see, it's all about implementation for me. Um, and how I got to this space was really from my clinical experience as a speech pathologist. So a little bit of a background, I guess, into how um, I came to be a researcher in this space and what drives me in my research. And I, I think it also potentially acknowledges some bias that I have coming from this clinical world and, and working in a number of different hospitals and health services across the years where I really found it challenging to be delivering what I thought was best practice. You know, we have the guidelines that can, can inform our practice in what we should be doing for people with aphasia. But as a clinician, um, there were circumstances where sometimes I was working in hospitals where there was no funding to provide rehab services, even though we had a rehabilitation ward. In some hospitals where I worked, there was no stroke unit or potentially there had been a stroke unit and then for various reasons that had ceased to function or the stroke unit was operating in a, in a different way where the beds weren't co-located and may not be, um, you know, in keeping with some of the recommendations around stroke unit um, care. So I think for me, I certainly found that it was, it was challenging and it, it's not to point out any particular hospital where, where I was working, but just that I just felt that that was an area I was really interested in was to try and improve this space. So what I'm going to talk about today is really providing an overview of implementation science in aphasia, a bit of a lay of the land, what we know so far. And I've drawn out a few key things that have come through some research that I've been involved with. So in particular, looking at how to develop tailored Im implementation interventions, collaborating with others to develop our implementation interventions, and also some um, issues around facilitating change. Then I'm gonna focus on a particular project that I've been working on, which has been around identifying implementation priorities in aphasia, and then um, finish off with some practical steps for implementation that I hope will be useful to people. I want to acknowledge that I understand there's probably quite a diverse audience um, with people having different experiences of implementation and different reasons for attending the seminar today. So um, hopefully there's a little bit of something for everyone in here. For clinicians, um, well, you can see at the bottom, I've got these goals. So I, I would hope that um, possibly people who are attending no matter where you are in your implementation you, you might 
um, hopefully take away an increased knowledge of the reasons why implementation science is an important area. And for the clinicians here, um, hopefully you can come away having a plan for what you want to change in your service and where you're going to start. And if you're working in that research space, I would love for you to come away with some plans to include implementation measures in your treatment studies or your research that you're doing. So I'm going to anchor my talk today with some examples of various projects I've been involved with. And um, so some of those discussions will be quite brief. So what I've just done is I've put in the QR codes if people want to uh, scan them and read those articles in more detail. But I'm also happy for people to contact me if you've got any questions as well about specific studies if we don't get time to cover all of those things. So implementation science, what is this thing? <laughs> And why do we need it? What is the problem? Um, essentially, as I said, there are evidence practice gaps in aphasia management across the continuum of care. And as clinicians, we can be guided by best practice statements and clinical practice guidelines that are based on the best available evidence, but it is really difficult in practice to implement these recommendations and what do we know about the evidence practice gaps in aphasia? It's difficult to say exactly what our gaps are. This study by Hubbard et al is a little bit out of date now, but you can see that when they looked at the adherence to the aphasia recommendations in the previous version of the stroke guidelines, recommendations, um, the adherence to that was quite poor but that was in keeping with other areas. So we, we know there's evidence practice gaps in, in all areas of healthcare. It's certainly not specific to aphasia. But it's difficult to know exactly what's happening now because of some issues with data collection that we have. Most aphasia practices are not routinely measured. So it's very difficult at the moment to compare one service to another and benchmark. We have some different data that's come out from a range of um, different studies, um, surveys, audits, and some implementation studies as well. And these are often self-report and they're specific to those hospitals that were involved. Thankfully, we've got uh, Dr. Sarah Wallace, who is leading a program of work around outcome measurement in aphasia with, with, with others as well. And so hopefully this area will improve. And I really encourage people to think about um, how they can measure whether they're implementing the aphasia recommendations. So for the clinicians here, really wanted you to have a think now, just off the top of your head, what could be the gaps in your service that immediately jump to mind? And how do you actually know that they're there? So if someone asked you to provide some evidence for those gaps, what could you show? And are you collecting any information um, to quantify you know, those gaps that you've identified? So just keep that in mind as we are talking. Um, so in terms of our clinical practice guidelines, they're very important. We know from lots of literature out there that clinical practice guidelines are effective in improving both the process of care and outcomes for patients. So very important if we can implement the recommendations, but as we know, it can be challenging. So this is where implementation science comes in. And a little bit of a word about terminology. What is implementation versus implementation science? So implementation is really doing the thing. It's the process of implementing that recommendation in practice or something else, implementing a tool or a new treatment or an innovation. So it's the doing and people are implementing all the time. When we're talking about implementation science, however, we're talking about the study of the methods of how that implementation is happening. So we're really looking at how does that actually happen and really trying to understand that so that we can replicate that and, and try to scale that up to improve the implementation overall. So key to implementation science um, as a field is really this concept of needing to be underpinned by theory. So 
what we want to see is theory underpinning implementation research where then we can develop some implementation interventions that we can test out, see if they work and try to understand why. So we really want to try and understand those pathways of how we get from the barriers or those factors that influence practice and influence change to actually then changing what we're doing. What is it? What is that key ingredient that gets us to that implementation space? And hopefully, as I said, this will provide a map for others to follow. It's really important to try and understand those mechanisms of behaviour change, what, what is actually happening and how. Let's get to head there. So when we... Um, talk about these implementation theories. I, one of the problems we have in this field is that there's so many. Um, and these are just some examples. Um, we, so we've got theories, we've got models and frameworks that are based on theories. Um, I've just popped some up here that I've used in my research and are quite well known, but I'm not gonna talk about them in a lot of depth. The theoretical domains framework is really more based at that individual level and it looks at those factors or determinants that are influencing clinicians' behaviour. Then we have the CIFA, the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, which looks more, it, also, it does include looking at the individuals, but also looks at more factors around the context as well. When we look at the Knowledge to Action Framework, that is... Um, a framework that also includes that knowledge creation and then the full process of implementation from identifying the gaps and the barriers right through to implementing change and monitoring and sustaining change. And then we have the behaviour change wheel, which is really used um, to help develop implementation strategies. So I just popped these here. You might have heard of them and it might just be something that you could take a note of to think about in your implementation work that you might like to do. So the reason why we need implementation science is that you might have heard of this statistic. It takes an estimated 17 years for only 14% of new scientific discoveries to enter day-to-day -day clinical practice. And so obviously as researchers, we don't want it to take that long for our research to get into practice. And as clinicians, we're really driven to be providing best practice. So we know that we need some active strategies to support implementation. It's not just gonna happen on its own. As we've talked about, it's really difficult to change practice and we know there's many barriers. So I wanted to point out some barriers that I identified through interviews with clinicians as part of my one of my studies within my PhD. And this was looking at barriers around providing aphasia-friendly information. So a relatively simple thing on the surface um, that you provide someone with aphasia information about their aphasia in a format that's accessible to them. And we found that there were quite a number of barriers that clinicians faced. And these are categorized here according to those domains, some of those domains within one of the frameworks I showed earlier. So we found that the most common barrier was around environmental context and resources. So clinicians reported barriers related to time and, and having um, not having appropriate resources for their setting. There were also barriers around their beliefs about the consequences or the benefits of providing that information. So some clinicians were worried that it wasn't going to be of benefit at um, a, a particular time, um, particularly for, clin um, for patients if they were drowsy or confused or, or they, the clinicians didn't think it was an, an appropriate time. We found as well that clinicians were quite influenced by the social norm and what they perceived were the expectations of others. So their perceptions of what the families wanted and, and patients as well as their colleagues and what their colleagues thought was a priority for them. But less often we did see there were some barriers around knowledge and skills. The reason that I'm pointing this out is because when we want to do something new or we want to improve something, what's the first thing we tend to do? Usually we provide education and training. But we found that for aphasia practices in general, 
the barriers aren't the most common barriers aren't knowledge or skills. So if we are providing education and training as the first port of call, that isn't actually going to be addressing the main barriers and we're likely not going to see practice change. So I'll just leave you to think about that for a moment. So when we're talking about implementation interventions and strategies, what does this mean? Um, Terminology is definitely an issue in implementation science. Implementation interventions is pretty much synonymous, um, can be used interchangeably with in, um, in implementation strategies. So I've just put them both there. Uh, I tend to call it implementation interventions, but sometimes I do find myself changing to strategies, but it is the same thing. So usually we're talking about strategies um, or interventions that are targeted at the healthcare professional. And that's been my experience with the majority of my research, but it can also be team-based, organisational, policy level, or at the patient and family level as well, just to acknowledge that. It's really key in terms of developing these implementation interventions that we tailor them to the barriers that we've identified. So we know from Cochrane reviews that tailored implementation interventions are more effective in changing practice than non-tailored interventions. And this makes sense. So in other words, the context is really important. We need to know what the clinicians are dealing with, what those barriers are. Having said that, as a caveat, tailored implementation interventions are not always effective. And when they are, we've seen from these larger synthesis that the effect size is small to moderate. So what that tells us is that we can't assume that a tailored intervention will work, we really need to still test it as part of the evaluation of the implementation intervention. So when I'm talking about these implementation interventions, what do I actually mean? Uh, they're things that you've probably done, been a part of, um, you've, you've definitely heard of these. So some examples here, and there's many, many more, would be educational materials, educational meetings, skills training, audit and feedback, outreach visits from experts, reminders or prompts, goal setting and action planning. And, and that's just a little snapshot of things that you're probably already doing as researchers or as clinicians to try and change things. So often we see that our implementation interventions are multifaceted and include multiple components to address those barriers. Okay, so tailored tailoring and tailored interventions. Do they work in aphasia care? So I did this pilot study as part of my PhD and it was a cluster randomized control trial with four hospitals. And we found that yes, our tailored implementation interventions were um, effective. They showed a significant improvement in practice three months after receiving the interventions for the four hospitals involved. So just to point out here, um, as I said, you can um, scan that if you like to read more about this particular study. But what we did was we had two sites that were allocated an implementation intervention to improve aphasia-friendly information provision. And then our other two sites were aiming to improve collaborative goal setting. So we also found within this study that there were some significant improvements in some of the implementation barriers that we were trying to address through our implementation, inter <clears throat> sorry, intervention, which really indicated that the implementation strategies, um, some components of that appeared to be working and to be directly linked to that practice change. So that was really promising, very exciting for me to be part of that as um, part of my PhD. And then we wanted to know, well, was that practice sustained? So what I did was I went back uh, two years later with the same hospitals and we looked at those same practices. And here in this graph, we can see before or to the left of our red line here, we have our implementation, our pre and post. And then we have two time points in our sustainability period where we were looking at after the fact, so um, one and two years later, were those practices sustained? So I'll just show you first off, we had our information provision sites and you can see their lovely results pre and post in our pilot study. And then 
follow, at follow up in, in our sustainability time periods, you really see that there was um, quite a drop off almost back to baseline or definitely back to baseline for one of those sites. So the aphasia friendly information were, that was not sustained. So the, the change that we saw in our pilot wasn't sustained. For our goal setting, it was um, a little bit better with our first site that's shown here in gray. But for our um, final site there in the yellow, we saw that they actually, they were the only site that continued to improve and then maintained that improvement in the sustainability period. So overall, that really was telling us that we can't be confident at all that our implementation efforts will be sustained. There's variable and fluctuating levels of sustainment, but overall three of the sites didn't sustain to that same level. Um, and when we looked at the factors that seemed to influence that, not to talk in too much detail, but we just really focused on that one. We looked at all of our sites, but when we looked at the difference with our one site that continued to improve, which was cluster three, we found that it was really the processes that was the key difference. So what they'd done was they had embedded some processes related to goal setting into their departmental policies, it was included in supervision, in orientation, in documentation templates. So we really felt that that was a key facilitator that enabled them to sustain that change because it wasn't relying on an individual. All sites had these barriers and facilitators around the inner context, around the organisational change and systems and resources. And there were, in, in general, very um, positive facilitating factors related to the speech pathology individuals. So we really think that it's important to consider those processes as well. In other words, you can't just set and forget, unfortunately. So we still need to monitor and support implementation to be sustained. So we've talked about tailoring. So I wanted to then discuss how we can collaborate with stakeholders to improve implementation. And I'm gonna talk about the work of Megan Treblecock, who did this as part of her PhD. So Megan developed an online implementation intervention called Aphasia Nexus, which aimed to improve the intensity and comprehensiveness of aphasia services. And when developing her intervention, the aphasia nexus intervention, um, Megan tailored it to the barriers as we've just discussed, but then took it a step further by collaborating with stakeholders during that development stage. So I'm just gonna focus on this um, second study within her PhD. So that was informed by the behavior change wheel, as well as something called the integrated knowledge translation process. Um, which is essentially about engaging with stakeholders early and often so that you can improve buy-in and develop strategies that are clinically relevant. So in terms of the process that Megan undertook, it was very rigorous and I'm not gonna go through the whole thing. The QR code is there if you wish to read more about it, but she conducted a series of focus groups and it was with clinicians from four different countries that met, so Megan navigated those time differences, and they met um, each week for three weeks, and they went through this process of looking at um, basically honing in on what would be most appropriate to include within the implementation intervention. So starting by looking at these broad categories um, of implementation strategies, and then going to that next phase of identifying and agreeing on more specific behavior change techniques, and then actually getting to that point of developing intervention strategies and specific ways that that could be implemented within the website. So because Megan, um, because it was designed for an international audience, that was really something that the participants were considering throughout this whole process. And they used this criteria called the appease criteria, which again is all outlined in the behavior change wheel book. Um, to really think about whether those implementation techniques or the behavior change strategies and the implementation strategies would be um, practical to include, whether they were acceptable, whether there were any risks associated and, and things like that. So Megan then went on to, to pilot that, to develop that into a, a, her website, pilot it and, and show that that was acceptable and led, led to some potential service changes with her pilot site. So really promising as well and just highlighting 
the work and the importance of collaborating with clinicians. Um, and I guess being different to what I had done in my study where I essentially developed my implementation strategy and then gone into the hospital and, and delivered it, Megan actually developed it in collaboration with the stakeholders. So now I'm going to just briefly touch on another important um, aspect of implementation science and actually getting to that practice change, which is around facilitation. And in this study, we were looking at improving implementation of communication partner training with a multidisciplinary team. And we developed our implementation strategy using the same approach as I went through before, where we tailored it uh, to the barriers that we'd identified. We collaborated with staff a little bit more. It was specific to one hospital. And then we had a speech pathologist who was on site, Julie Scott, who was um, basically delivering that implementation strategy and, and, and a training was part of that. So we had two groups of staff who participated. And the reason I wanted to highlight this is because we saw significant improvements in practice with our second group, but no change for our first group. So what was the difference between our group one and our group two? Essentially, based on the feedback and, and our focus group and our surveys that we did with our group one participants, we found that they had the best intentions, you know, to implement the strategies that they'd learnt and how to communicate, but other things got in the way and it didn't necessarily stay at the forefront of their minds. So they really needed ongoing facilitation and support which is what we did differently with our second group. So there was more follow-up support for that group too. And that was, you know, scheduled check-ins, uh, feedback on performance, um, specific review of staff's own goals around how to communicate and use of strategies with people with aphasia, and then provision of additional support to those staff who identified needs and ongoing support needs. So that was really key and, I, and, and the reason I highlighted that is to show that I think unless you've got someone on the ground driving it, it can be really difficult, things will come up, um, particularly we've seen, of course, in the last few years, there's been a lot of change in health services um, and their need to respond to things such as the pandemic. So really important to think about how you um, will support those changes and who's going to be responsible for doing that? Who's going to be leading that on the ground and checking in with staff? So what have we learned so far? Um, we think that tailoring and collaborating is really important for the development of implementation strategies and that facilitation is important to support that ongoing practice change and facilitate that change in the real world, real world context. So involving clinical stakeholders early may improve implementation, but clinicians and services really need ongoing support to do so. Um, they need resources and tools to help them change practice. And we also know that different services will have different requirements as well as different priorities. And it's not possible to do everything at once as, as much as we would like to do that. So we need to start to think a bit more strategically then how are we going to address this? Is there a way where we can work together across departments, across hospitals and states to really be trying to address the same implementation priorities and learn from each other and support each other? So what are these implementation priorities and, and how can we start to think about things a bit differently? So this led on to my um, next project that I want to talk about, which is really looking at these priorities in aphasia implementation. And you can see there's a, um, a large number of collaborators on this project, and I'd like to thank everyone, and I really appreciate everyone's contribution and input. This is not published yet, so it's in progress, um, and I had some support from a, a UQ New Staff grant. So what we wanted to do is identify the top three priorities for implementation in aphasia services in Australia. And that was with the view to then be able to develop a toolkit to improve implementation for these priorities that we'd identified. 
So at the beginning, we wanted to really start by identifying some recommendations to take forward to prioritise, and we needed to consider some implementation criteria for that. So we adapted um, a process that we developed as part of another project with the Stroke Foundation and really looked at some key implementation criteria. So is there evidence for those recommendations? Is it clinically important to people with lived experience as well as clinicians? Is it feasible and possible to change that practice? Is there an evidence practice gap that we think needs to be addressed? And what is the impact and who would it benefit? Um, so considering the, the impact of that and, and, and if it would benefit many people or a few people and things like that. So there were three phases to this project and I will um, talk about each of those on the next few slides. But those criteria were really underpinning the whole process. So in the first phase, we wanted to identify those um, key recommendations that we thought could be part of that initial set. We look at the aphasia best practice statements and there's 82 statements. So we really wanted to say, well, from the 82, which are some ones that we can present to people to prioritise? And we essentially extracted recommendations that were based on strong or high levels of evidence. So we looked at the best practice statements for aphasia as well as the living guidelines and identified 23 recommendations from them. And then we also wanted to include recommendations that may not be in those guidelines or may not be underpinned by high levels of evidence from the guidelines but were identified as being important to people with lived experience. So this um, study that's just recently been published by Sarah Wallace and others really looked at the priorities or not so much the priorities, sorry, the recommendations that were missing from the existing um, recommendations. So we added in the ones that weren't included and then we bundled the similar ones together to, to lead to 23 from this initial process. And then what we did was we took those 23 recommendations and put them into a survey and sent it out to identify which ones were the most important. So we had 108 people respond to that, including 82 clinicians and 26 people with lived experience of aphasia. And essentially what they did was they scored the importance of each of those 23 recommendations. So how important is this recommendation on a scale of one to 10? So it was quite a straightforward survey. And from that, we were able to identify the 10 most important as voted by the participants in that survey. And I've just popped them up here in case you're interested. Um, just to highlight, you know, I won't read through every single one, but you know, there were recommendations around assessment, information provision to people with aphasia and carers, communication partner training to familiar partners such as family, as well as um, multidisciplinary team members and, and, and um, healthcare providers. There was recommendation around goal setting, providing person family-centered care, being offered therapy for those people who had ongoing goals, providing comprehensive and individualized treatment and evidence-based treatment as well. So they were our top 10. And then we went back out with another survey and asked people to then re, well, to rank them essentially, looking at, well, which ones of these are most important and which ones are most feasible. So in this second round, I think they were only a couple of weeks apart. So they were pretty close together. We had 66 respondents with our clinicians and our people with lived experience we presented those 10 recommendations and asked them to rank the relative importance. So of these 10, which is the most important, which is the second most important, et cetera. And then our clinicians also ranked the feasibility of implementing those recommendations as well. So I'll show you the results of that. And just to thank Professor Leonid Cherlov who supported the analysis so we used a graph theory based voting system and here's the results plotted where we've got the importance and the feasibility and the higher, the most important ones are ranked higher. So I'll show you on the next slide basically what that looks like. So for 
importance, we saw that the most important recommendation was comprehensive and individualized therapy, followed by assessment, goal setting, and then all people with aphasia being offered therapy. Then when we looked at our feasibility results, we saw that the most feasible recommendation was assessment, followed by all people with aphasia being offered therapy, information and person and family centered services. So then what we did was we removed the least important and least feasible recommendations. So we essentially shortlisted the top six here. So I've just popped them up on another slide so you can look at them. I'll just skip so you can see them all. Just to point out with these top six that we had got to this point, the assessment one is really looking at assessment by a speech pathologist to determine the presence and severity of aphasia. So there was a separate recommendation for screening, which didn't make it through to the top 10. So this one is about the speech pathology assessment. So you can see our, our top six that were shortlisted. So assessment, information provision, collaborative goal setting, person family centered services, being offered therapy for those with ongoing goals and comprehensive and individualized treatment. And I just popped on one side the icons just to sort of show where they originated from. And you can see the majority with the purple there, they're the ones that came from the published recommendations or the guidelines or best practice statements. And here in the orange, it was the, the people with aphasia and their family members. They were those additional recommendations that were identified in Sarah's study. So this one, um, number four, around person and family centred services, it was really nice to see that that was viewed as being really, really important, even though it wasn't necessarily a recommendation in itself in the published guidelines. So then what we did from there is we took those top six forward to a prioritisation workshop where we really wanted to, from that, that point, identify the top three priorities. So that was a two hour online workshop we did and we considered those six shortlisted recommendations against the criteria that we had um, developed, discussed each of those as a group and then there was individual anonymized voting. So for our participants for that workshop, we had 12 people in total. So five people with lived experience of aphasia and seven speech pathologists. And you can see for the speech pathologists, they primarily came from acute and rehab services, or they may have worked across both. There was representation from metropolitan and regional areas, but only one um, person who came from a private practice um, work setting. So that was a limitation. They were primarily um, public health service clinicians. And these were the priorities, um, the criteria that we were looking at when we went through our priorities um, or our potential priorities, I should say. So we looked at those questions around feasibility. Is it possible to change practice? Is this something we can achieve? We looked at what we knew about the evidence practice gap data, uh, if there was any and, and what the gap was showing us. And we looked at some of that, the research literature around the impact of those recommendations on outcomes. And we had discussion around each of those points as well from people's perspectives. So we wanted to really make people feel comfortable in this process. And we understood that it was, it was quite a challenging thing for people to do. And, and it was almost like going into an ice cream parlor and trying to choose what scoop of ice cream you're gonna get. And you can only pick one or two maybe you get a triple scoop so you can have your three but basically you know they're all good so it's really hard to choose and we wanted to make people feel comfortable with the knowledge that we'd gone through this rigorous process and they were all informed by evidence they were all um, important to people so there wasn't really a wrong answer but it was really you know up to them in the end to choose the ones that they um, thought were the priorities so really trying to highlight to people those things, that there was strong evidence it was important. But we did want to consider what would have the largest impact in the shortest amount of time as well, because we didn't have additional funding to go out and provide 
new service delivery models. It was really about using existing resources differently um, or maybe providing some, some relatively low cost resources to support those implementation priorities. So this was a bit of a snapshot of the evidence and the discussion that we went through. So as I said, we really um, talked about that there was existing evidence for all of those recommendations. We knew they were important based on the surveys that we'd done. We discussed the feasibility, looked at some of the survey results, and people had the opportunity to talk about their own experience as well in terms of whether they received that aspect of care, whether they provided it, what was challenging about that, would they have liked it? And it was really, um, it was really important and interesting and valuable discussion around all of these points. We knew that some areas didn't have um, published data about a gap, but again, people talked about whether or not they provided it or whether they received it. And we talked about the research evidence and what people thought about the impact. So then we went to our vote um, right at the end. And you can see there, just from our total points down the side, that the top priority that was identified by our participants was assessment. Our second priority was information provision. And then our third was being offered aphasia therapy. So I'll just pop them. I've got them on the next slide so you can read them, the exact wording in a bit more detail there. And it was really nice thing to do to have that vote right at the end. So, you know, we'd spent a long time, we'd sent out materials before, we'd spent that two hours discussing everything and to have that vote with the immediate results shown back to the participants at the end was really exciting. And it meant that we had a really clear answer. And it was very obvious if we look back again, that the assessment was definitely the number one. <laughs> um, and that reflected the discussion that people had as well. So then what's next looking forward with this work is we're going to develop tools and resources to support implementation of those three priorities, then pilot the tools to see if practice improves. So I've developed a prototype for one of the topics, which was that information provision priority two, which is actually being tested right now. So we have a site who's looking at that and um, hopefully we'll have some results to share next year. So I wanted to talk about um, some practical steps in implementation and some resources that people can use and take away with, our, um, with a few more minutes to go. So I still have time for questions. Um, this is sort of a summary of what we've talked about, but I'll just go on to where you can actually start. So if you're a clinician, it's really important in implementation to plan. You don't want to skip ahead too quickly. So really consider the implementation topic. Is it important? You need to talk to your team and identify what is the priority for your service. So you can do step one and two together. So it might also be helpful to look at auditing your practice. So maybe you start at the, the three priorities that we identified, or you might broaden that out to the top 10. Look at your practice, look at the gaps, talk to your team and agree, well, what do you think is feasible and important and what do you all want to work on? Then you can identify your local barriers and you can do that quite informally through your regular meetings or you could go on the more formal um, style and do a, a survey and there's a published surveys out there that you can adapt. And then the bit that is really important is once you identify those barriers is to actually match them to some strategies. So I'm going to just quickly show you in a moment some resources you can use for that. So then this all sounds very easy, but obviously it's quite time consuming. Um, then you deliver your strategies. So say you've got your resources that you want to use, and then you might have a system or a procedure in place and some action planning around that. So what's the goal for the department? Uh, when are you going to do it? Who's responsible? What are the individual steps to go through? You want to monitor that progress, check in with the team, identify problems as they come up, and then after a period of time, review the audit that you did at the beginning. So if you're a researcher, you probably already know the implementation topic because it's probably the thing you're researching, but it's still really important to look at um, what stakeholders think about that, what could be potential barriers. And if you're doing a study looking at treatment, there's 
ways that are relatively straightforward of just adding particular questions into your survey um, around barriers or if you're doing interviews with staff you could ask how they experienced it and if you know what what they see might be needed to implement that into usual care so there's some easy low risk things that you can add to your studies that will be really helpful and that will inform your scale up or your next research when potentially you're looking at implementation more formally so my top tips, engage with stakeholders to understand the context, use a theory and framework from the start if possible, um, get help with that. There's lots of people out there and I'm happy to support anyone. So just reach out. Um, really important to collect baseline data at the beginning. As I said, you can use um, a survey that's been published and validated and just adapt some of the wording. So there's one by Huey Get Al and um, if you're doing some training, I'd encourage you to really think about what it is in the training that you think is leading to or you hope is leading to a change in practice. And you can really start to unpack that a little bit more. So just before, just because I, oh, I don't know where this time went, but um, just to show you these resources around matching the barriers to behaviour change strategies or, or techniques there's there's a few different things here that I just suggest um, are really easy to use so there's the behavior change wheel book which has worksheets by Mickey et al and you can purchase that as an ebook and it's relatively inexpensive and there's some other studies by Mickey and colleagues that go through the process in more detail but just recently I think in the last year or so they've developed a website that's actually makes that a lot um, a lot easier and so it's the theory and technique tool there where you can actually put in your barriers and it will spit out some potential behavior change techniques that match those barriers so you've still got to do thinking around it and to, to see if they will be appropriate but it's a really um, easy to use tool and another one that's quite similar is called the CIFA to ERIC implementation strategy matching tools it's a bit of a mouthful but again, um, really easy to use and you put in your barriers and it will tell you some <laughs> potential implementation strategies to use. So you do still need to think about what's feasible and appropriate, but um, yeah, really encourage people to, to have a look at those resources. And just lastly, um, if anyone is interested in doing more research in this space or connecting with others, we have our um, working group in the collaboration of aphasia trialists and you can look at that link and it's free to join and we're open to having new members so please reach out if you'd like to join with us and that was really all while while John's getting ready to look at these questions I would encourage people just to think about what it is in their service they would like to change so having a goal from today so just grab a piece of paper or write it in your phone what do you want to change in your service and why? Who do you need to talk to? And what's the first step you need to undertake to achieve that change? And for researchers, I want you to think of one way that you can add an implementation aspect to your current or your next study. And then it'd be great if people can get back to me later and let me know if they actually did any of those things. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirstine, for presenting today and um, presenting a lot of work. You've done a lot of work over the last few years on this. Um, I think it's a topic that we've got both researchers and clinicians interested in, and you've really had very practical tips for both sides. So thanks so much. Um, my question I'm going to start with, which is, you know, the barrier of time and resources is you know, often cited as one of the top barriers and it's it's absolutely true, but it's also kind of eternal, like we're never going to have masses of funding for clinicians so that they'll have lots and lots of time. So what can we do about that one? What are the approaches that, that are suited to that barrier? Um, that's a really good point. I think what we found in some of our research as well was that yeah, clinicians need to prioritise because time is always a factor. But when people really believe in the thing that they're doing, that they strongly think it will make a difference to that person 
and that person's care and that person's outcomes it will they will make that time somehow magically um so I think sometimes it's really important then to focus on those key areas and and really sometimes tap into those beliefs that clinicians have um what we found in some of our research is having that consumer voice or the the person with lived experience come and talk about their experience because often we don't know particularly in acute services things move so quickly that it's not we don't really get that feedback from Mm. patients in the ward so I think sometimes it's really powerful to have someone come back and say actually I would have liked a handout or I felt like I missed out I didn't know what aphasia was if I'd received that early it would have made a difference and so yeah, there's so much for clinicians to remember, but I think that um, sometimes it is time, but sometimes it's also having that belief and confidence that what we're doing is actually going to make that difference. Mm, so that consumer voice sort of brings it to life. Yeah. Yep. Okay, we'll have a look at the question panel. Uh, we've got a cracker of a question from Richard Lindley. He said, thanks for Kirsten for a great talk. The slide of the six priorities for implementation would at first sight seem to be merely almost minimum standards for an aphasia service. Why do you think that these six items are not done well in routine practice? Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you. I was initially a bit surprised, I have to say, like with the assessment one, I thought, I I agree, I think that it's almost like that minimum standard of, well, I think everybody does assess, but maybe we just don't know enough about what assessments to use, when, is the best time to, to do those assessments. Um, so I think there's some work that needs to be done in that space. And, and luckily we do have people like Sarah Wallace who are leading that and really looking at that minimum, the minimum standards of care. I think that that is a huge problem is that we're not really measuring that. So one of the, the recommendations around people being offered therapy, we actually don't have mm. good data on that. So we assume that people with aphasia get some sort of therapy, but it's a massive assumption. Um, With the stroke data that they're collecting at the moment, it's a combination of swallowing and communication therapy. So it actually doesn't pull that out at the moment. The stroke Um, audit, you mean? Yeah, with the stroke audit data. So it's actually combined. Um, Yeah, so I think there's some challenges around really what's being done consistently and, and having good guidance on those and I think with information provision sometimes again it's something we just assume happens but um, it might not be done consistently and it might not be documented that it's done so um, yeah there's there's, I want to try and understand some of those things more Hmm. yeah I mean the the (laughs) fact that individualized therapy was rated as low visibility really really shocked me it was kind of yeah, actually, that's that's a good point. Um, we talked about that. I think it's feasibility too. I think sometimes people looked at these other recommendations and thought, yes, this is the minimum we should be doing and maybe we're not doing it consistently. So let's start off with that before mm. we try and get to that. Some, some things that potentially are more complex, like providing that comprehensive or evidence-based treatment. We know we need to do it, but potentially that's more complex. So let's mm-hmm. just start with yeah. the really basic stuff and get it right. Mm. Yeah. Uh, okay. Question from Kelvin Hill. Fabulous presentation. In the prioritization process, uh, what was suggested to measure quality? Sorry, to measure slash quantify impact, and was there consistency between clinicians and those with lived experience? Um. Thanks for that, Kelvin. We really looked at, I guess, the evidence that was underpinning the recommendations and and whether that included people with aphasia and um, sort of looked at things like effect sizes and other things like that. But some of those um, areas didn't include people with aphasia in the studies. So then, so that was really, there was some missing data there around that. So we said that some of those areas were likely, we could, we could foresee that because it was related to stroke, it probably would impact people with aphasia but there's a gap in some of our research not including people with aphasia so yeah that's where those um, numbers came from yeah it raises the question like if something is shown to be true for stroke survivors in general do we need a a sub-study for people with aphasia or not and 
I guess it There's depends people on what working it is. on that. But but I'm really interested in let's just get on with the implementation of, yep. of yep. the the care thing that we know is good practice for all stroke people. Like yeah, yeah, always practical. All right, time for one more question, which is from Linda yeah. Worrell. Um, any idea how your top ten recommendations fit with the Aphasia United top ten? And that was a source of some, wasn't it? Of, of yeah, it was. List. Thanks, Linda. I actually did include that, but I just thought. I wouldn't talk about all the complexities of the recommendations. So um, we did actually include the um, recommendations that were in the Aphasia United top 10 as well. Yeah. And our uh, the final list, did they, how much overlap was there with the top 10 or am I stretching your memory with that question? You, yeah, I'll have to have a look at that. <laughs> yeah, sure. No problem. Well, thank you once again, Kirstine. And um we are busily sorting out our schedule for next year, 2024. So stay tuned on the Aphasia CRE blog for some of those dates. Um, and if you have any further questions or some follow-up for Kirstine, please do feel free to email her. Thanks so much, Kirstine. Thank you.